Well, good morning to you. I like it. In our church, we talk back, so I feel at home. This is good. My name is Josh Carter. I'm a, as they said, I'm a church planter in Portland, Oregon, and um, I look like I'm 19, but I'm not. Uh, so 37, four kids. I have two, uh, beautiful wife, Amy, and I have two, not two wives, just one wife, but two, <laughs> two amazing Oregonians in our home who have changed our life uh, since we've moved to Oregon, but we have four now, a nine, nine-year-old boy, my boy, and I have three girls, which means I'm broke, uh, which is seven, five, and one, and, uh, and so the Lord's uh, just multiplied our, our, our family since being there. And uh, continues to do a great work in the church. And, you know, I know I've got a lot. To, I can share a lot about our church and what God's doing and the great miracles that we've seen, uh, lives transformed and, and things. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, if you spend much time with you, I'm going to tell you how hard it is. Um, and I watched many guys come to our city, leave our city. Um, and honestly, I, I hurt for my, um, my other brothers and sisters in Christ who are just servants. And Dan and just, just we were talking this morning about just guys that we know mutual in the cities and, and, you know, just servants of the Lord and are literally doing it out of pure obedience to their king. And I honor him. I honor all of our planters. You know, if you go to any church planting conference, every church planter is going to tell you why their city is the hardest city to plant in. It's because it's like the vernacular that we, that we have. But let me tell you why. Um, um, planting a church anywhere is hard. And the reason why is because it is a, um, it's a God thing and you have no control on it. And it was never for you to, to carry the burden of. But because we love people and love our king and love, want to see more people come to know him and experience his kingdom, the burden that we live with is, I think, the same burden that the Apostle Paul left, lived with, that um, what, what better way to spend our life as servants? Um, that doesn't mean we have to be professional Christians. Um, you know, I went to seminary. Sometimes I call it cemetery. Um, but it doesn't mean we have professional Christians. It means what does it look like for you to be an everyday missionary in the kingdom of God where you live, work, and play? And I think that's important, um, really important. But it doesn't come without suffering. And I think the Christian life is not a life of, of just um, living up the American dream. I think the Christian life is a life of learning how to be content and have joy in suffering. Um, and to give our lives um, literally as a payment, not to earn our salvation, but because we have salvation, to give back to the king that we love and adore uh, for his mission, his mission alone. And, and so that's what we're doing in Portland and trying to do it and try to live into that. And it's been very, very difficult and very, very amazing and incredible at the same time. And so if you're with me this morning, um, obviously you are, you're in the room, but Revelations 5, 9, I want you to open up there. And um, again, you're going to have to talk back to me this morning. I'm, I'm originally from Tennessee. So when I'm back here, I get to say y'all. And it's amazing because um, our, you can understand me. So I'm going to talk really fast because I got a lot of content this morning. But I've got, to, I've got to build a framework for you to really jump into what we really want to talk about to give you some practical understanding of what's it look like to live every day in the kingdom of God. So Revelation 5, 9, if you're with me, say I'm with you. That's awful. This is going to be a long day. If, if you're with me, say I'm with you. I'm with you. I like it. Okay, here we go. Revelation 5, 9, the, the, the Word of God says this. It says, and they sing a new song. They sing a new song saying, and this is describing a scene in heaven. The voice, listen, a, a, a voice from heaven comes down of, of believers praising God. This is a, a, a picture that, that John gets of believers worshiping God. Saints, as we just sang about worshiping God, and listen to what we're praising God about. We're saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by the blood you ransomed people from, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them. This is a, a past tense. It means this is something that's already been done. At the time that this picture is taking place, at the time that this picture is taking place, it's the end of time. All time is led to this time where the Bible tells us that people from every tongue and nation and tribe and people and language are all going to be gathered around the throne of God, and we're singing to him, Worthy are you to take the scroll. Worthy are you, King Jesus. And then if you, if you keep reading, it says, You have made them a what? A what? A kingdom. He says, You have made them a kingdom. So what's happening here? You see this, this mission of God in this picture of Revelation 5, 9, to what all of time is headed to. Here's, here's, here's why this is important for you. This has major implications for your life, not just for the future, but for today. 
Because this is the mission that your king, King Jesus, is on today. So, so if you're here this morning and you're a saint, if you're here this morning and you're a Jesus follower, you're actually in Revelation 5.9. Like you're standing, like, like you're saying these words. Like that should get an amen or something. Like you're in, like you're in this text. Like this is, this is where your life is headed. I want you to feel that. And one day you're standing before the throne of God and you're saying, worthy are you, King Jesus. Worthy are you to take the scroll. Worthy are you, King Jesus, because you have made a kingdom of people. A kingdom, a, a nation, a tribe, of, a, a people of every language, nation, and tribe. You have made this kingdom. And you see this in, is great, the greatest desire on his life, on, on King Jesus' life, was to see this kingdom expressed and lived out in a way that we would experience it then in Revelation 5.9. That is what God is doing right now. That is what God is doing right now, building this kingdom, because Revelation 5.9 is going to happen. And you get to be a part of that. So here's the question. Did at any point this week, when you went to work, or you went to school, or you got up and you were driving down the road and you got in traffic, or or you're in conversations with a neighbor, at any point this, this week did you think to yourself, God is making Revelation 9, 5, 9 happen, like in my presence. Like the kingdom of God is being built around me right now. Did at any point did you think to yourself, not about all the stuff you had going on this week, not about your schedule and the things that the kids are doing, not about your finances, not worried about your health. All those, all those things are important. But at any point this week, did you sit down and think, I'm on this mission to see Revelation 5, 9 happen. And it's going to happen regardless if I jump in or not, by the way. But, but God's doing this mission today to make Revelation 5, 9 happen one day. He's building a kingdom today. God is at work today to make this happen. When John wrote this, when John wrote this, if you can look in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, uh, the, the word says, write in the book. The voice tells John to write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. That means the vision that was given to John of Revelation 5, 9 was not just for then. He said for the seven churches, that means it's for you. This, like, this vision that he has, that he writes about, is for you to see. It's like, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it gives you hope. That this is going to happen. This gives you joy that, that you get to be there as a follower of Jesus. Like This is a vision that you're supposed to live with every day. It's a vision that you're supposed to have every day. It's supposed to have daily implications for your life. And it was important that the Lord, that our Father, made this vision known to us. And so we're standing here in 2020 and we're saying, hey, this is where your life is headed. Do you ever think about it? Do you ever think about your daily actions and how it plays into this vision and this mission of Revelation 5-9. So here's what's interesting. Perspective is very, very important, isn't it? So to say that my perspective as a father was different when I didn't have kids to when I, do had, when I did have kids is an understatement. Amen? Understatement. Like, like how many in the room were those people, and I was one of these parents, where before you had kids, you were one of the if I ever have kids, I'll never do that, parent. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Right? And then you have kids, and you're like worse than the people that you said you would never be. Right? Right? So I remember when my son, he was only two at the time, and, you know, um, I decided uh, that, you know, I wanted to take him on a field trip, you know, and teaching man things, you know. And so at two, I decided, you know, I'm going to take him to the place that all men should take their son to, and um, a place called Lowe's. And, and... <laughs> And so, because every man should take their son to Lowe's. And I love going to Lowe's because I can take my son through Lowe's and we can talk about tools. I don't know what really they do, but they look cool. And it makes me feel like a man when I'm holding the tools at Lowe's. So I decided to go there. And, you know, women, what, moms are smart. You know, like they're like brilliant people. Um, we're not so much. And we're very reactionary as men, um, you know, just kind of in the moment. But she thinks through everything, right? It's like, like she's got, you know, four kids now. Like she would never go to the grocery store with them, Right. Like, I still think I can do it, right? So um, they came up with this amazing thing called delivery service. And, like, she, all the time, right? 
So she thinks through things. But I decided, you know, I'm going to take my two-year-old, and we're not going to get a buggy this time. We're just going to, like, he's going to walk through Lowe's, right? And so he's doing, like, the penguin walk. You know, he can barely walk, right? And, and so I'm thinking, this is just going to be an amazing trip. And, uh, and so I decided I had, to, I had to get some paint supplies that day. And so I grabbed all these paint supplies, and I was going up to the, you know, the counter. There was a line of people, you know. This is before self-checkout, really. I mean, it was just kind of getting going. But, um, but, but we were standing in line and uh, waiting our turn. But, you know, he's two years old, right? So he's not focused on standing in line. But I was one of those parents. Like, when I have a kid, he's going to stand in line, right? So I'm waiting, and every time I would, like, you know, grab things to, you know, get ready to put it up on the counter, he'd take off, right? So I have to get my stuff, and I have to go after him, right? And then I was, like, constantly getting back in line. And every time I get out of line, somebody would get in front of me, right? And so, but I was always that parent, right? Until I actually went to Lowe's and experienced what it was like to take a two-year-old at Lowe's, right? And experienced the, that they don't listen to you all the time. You know, perspective, perspective is everything. When you actually experience something, it, it, it's different. You know, the Bible talks a lot about understanding and knowledge and understanding, right? There's a separation between knowing about God and, like, knowing God, right? Like, it's different for my son to say, my dad, my dad loves me, but he, when, he, when, when he experiences my love, it's different, right? When he messes up and I still love him, like, there's a difference there. And God doesn't want you to stay in the head. He wants you to, to stay in the heart, right? He wants this, this Revelation 5, 9 to shift your heart, your perspective about how you live your life every day. There's a, um, there's a subject in the Bible that I believe is the most misunderstood subject in all the Bible. And I believe if you understood it, it would literally go from your head to your heart in a way that would change your perspective about how you, uh, how you live your life. How you live your life. Um, in fact, this subject might be the most un- misunderstood in all Scripture. God's entire word is built around this one subject. For instance, just in the New Testament alone, this subject is talked about over 150 times, people. Over 80 times in the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This subject was and is God's primary focus, his primary focus, his primary desire, the life of Jesus Christ coming. Number one. Anybody know what that subject is? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the most misunderstood subject in all the world, and it has daily implications for your life. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, i got to build a framework for you. What's the kingdom of God? Well, I could, we could have a whole seminary class on this, right? What's the kingdom of God? But I'll give you a couple of definitions. One of my mentors, Pastor Vance Pittman, um, I lived in Las Vegas for a while, served on his team. Um, he says it like this. He says, the kingdom of God is God's sovereign activity resulting in people coming into a right relationship with God. I love what Pastor Tony Evans says. I love, the, I love his definition. He says, The kingdom of God is the visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God on every area of your life. I love that. Tony Evans says, The kingdom of God is God's rule on every area of your life. The way you raise your kids, the way you run your business, the way you, listen to me, the way you use your retirement, the, way you go, the reason you go to school. Like the, 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 the kingdom of God in your life is the rule of of, of Christ's rule in your life. It's, it's, it's his reign in your life. We tell our church this. The kingdom of God is literally the rule and reign. It's the rule and reign. That you look at every aspect of your life as, as a person in a kingdom with a king. King Jesus. And that is a defining perspective change. Let me give you a defining statement. The defining statement is this. The church was never his goal. was it? The church was not the goal. The church is just a tool to get to the goal. Could you imagine going to like a, um, a construction zone site and all the people were, had the tools and they weren't actually building the building, they were sitting around playing with the tool? Hang on. The church was never for us to focus on. The kingdom was what we were supposed to focus on, and the church was the tool to manifest the kingdom. But most of us don't know what that looks like because we're so focused on going to church. And the way Revelation 5-9 is going to happen, it's not that we just focus on church. 
It's, it's how does the kingdom reign in my life in such a way that the kingdom is expanded outside these walls into our communities where the rule and reign of Christ is not only in my life, but it's being discipled in other people's lives. What does the rule and reign of Christ look like? And so these people in Revelation 5, 9 are standing before the throne of God. And these are people who are under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And they're saying, I gave my life to my king. My job, my finances, the way I raised my kids, everything was under his rule and reign. And then if, if, you, if we were living as a people under the rule and reign of Christ, the church, the ecclesia, the people together as one doing that, that's the power of God through people to die to themselves to live under the rule and reign of Christ. If you're with me, say I'm with you. Okay, I got about half of you, so we're good. This is a framework. This is, this is massive implication for your life. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. Some of us think that the book of Acts is about the church. It's not about the church. I'll prove it. Acts 1 Acts 1, verse 3, Jesus has been crucified, he's resurrected, he's about to go back to heaven, right? He's about to ascend to the Father, right? He spends 40 days, his last 40 days on the earth. Acts 3, Acts 1, 3. His last 40 days on the earth, and I want you to look on the screen what Jesus says. His la- this is, this is Jesus' last words to his disciples. Don't you think in the last 40 days if his time with his disciples, he's going to talk about the most important thing to him. This is what he says. He says, To these he, Jesus, also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things according to the church. Is that what it says? No. He says that he spoke about the things according to the what? The kingdom of God. Right? The kingdom of God. Now, flip to the end of the book of Acts. Acts 28. Verse 30, 31, you see the Apostle Paul here. He's in Rome. And the Apostle Paul spent the, the, the later e- the days of his life in house arrest. And I want you to look what Paul, it says that Paul did in his, in his later days of his life. He says, and he, Paul, stayed two full years in his own house, rented quarters, and was welcoming all who came in, preaching the church. Preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness and unhinderedness. The one book in the Bible that the majority of Christians would say is the central book to refining the church is not about the church. The one central book that we most of us think that the, the defines the, the, the church today is really about the kingdom of God. And the church is the tool to how the kingdom of God is expressed. So it looks like this. Practically, that means that we as the church, not a place, but a people, the church are supposed to be manifesting the rule and reign of Christ in our life, the kingdom. Like we are the ones that are supposed to demonstrate what it looks like to live in a kingdom. But let me tell you the problem with that. Most of us and all of us, praise God for it, we've all grown up in a republic. His kingdom's not a democracy. It's not a republic. It's a monarch. And it's hard for us who grew up in a republic to get what it looks like to live in a kingdom. When you have a king, you don't get a say. Don't email me, email Dave. <laughs> you, don't get, you don't get a say. You don't get a say on the job. You don't get a say on what you should get your education in. You should ask your king. You know why? Because he has a, a goal. And his goal is Revelation 5, 9. It's going to happen. And he's inviting you in on that to use your gifts, skills, and abilities in your life to manifest the rule and reign of himself in this world. Jesus said so. He says, he said, I prayed. He said, I, I pray that my kingdom what? Come on where? Earth as it is in heaven. So the Christian life is not let me pray a prayer so I can go to heaven. The Christian life is let heaven come to earth. And the way that heaven comes to the earth is God's people, the church, living with perspective of the kingdom under the rule and reign of Christ and using their entire life to see that Revelation 5-9 becomes a reality on earth. We, um, we have a, a large majority of our community is Indian. They're Hindu. And um, so the, the Christians there, uh, we did a combined deal service with them, and I preached a message to them, and I said, you know what? This is a beautiful sight, but it doesn't happen enough. But I said, you know what, like in heaven, this is what it's going to look like. But the problem is we think that somehow like we're just going to wake up one day and get used to this. 
So it's like we're like way over here, but Revelation 5, 9 shows me like way over here. Are you with me? And what should be happening in this world is we should start moving towards that. Because that's going to happen. Like we expect it to be like, let's all keep segregated over here. And then one day like we'll just jump over here to Revelation 5, 9 and like actually enjoy it. Like, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be people of the kingdom under the rule and reign of Christ. And if we're under the rule and reign of Christ, we should start looking like that. That'll mess up our American culture big time. Sorry. So here's a question. Do you ever think about your life like that? Have you ever thought about that? I've got to hurry. I don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to read this next text, but I'll just tell you about it. To understand this framework, you've got to also understand back to the beginning. And I can nerd out on this for a second, but back in the beginning... God created this angel called Lucifer, and Lucifer was a beautiful angel. He actually, um, they, uh, his, his name means shining one. And if you go all the way back to the Old Testament where he talks about him, and uh, the Bible talks about him in Ezekiel 28, and in that passage, Lucifer is defined as um, all these jewels. And Lucifer, tw- um, sorry, Ezekiel 28, verse 13, you can read about it. And in that passage, it talks about he was a great cherub, and he, um, he wasn't like the, the pitchfork guy that we think about, right? He was this beautiful angel. But there was a, there was a fault in, 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 uh, in Lucifer where his greatest desire was to be his own king, his own God. And so the Bible goes on in that passage and tells us that because he was unrighteous and because he wanted to be God, and God would not give his glory up for anybody, because he wanted to be God, um, God cast him to the earth. And when he cast him to the earth, um, Lucifer was able to uh, deceive a third of all the angels to go with him. So today, there's a third of all the angels. We don't know how many, that, how many that is. It could be billions, millions, I don't know. But there's a third of the angels. And what, what he's called is the prince of darkness, the, uh, the prince of the air. And so what permeates our culture and what permeates our world today in our sin is this, the same thing that, that Lucifer had in him is now being fleshed through him, through his angels in our lives, and it's, it's controlling the world. And the way it's controlling the world, it's like this. It's like, uh, what's, what's the, the main kind of flaw? The main kind of flaw is that everybody wants to be their own king. They want to be their own God. So if you always know, if you, if you, if you really want to step into lost people's lives who don't know Jesus, what they're all struggling with is trying to hold on to their kingdom. And that's why it's a me-first mentality. You with me? See, this is not like a, just an American thing. This is a sinful thing. It's a, it's a Genesis thing. And so Satan is deceiving people to think that their kingdoms are actually going to last. And one of the saddest parts, um, one of the saddest things for people is that they spend all of their life building their own kingdom for only to go to waste. Right? So, for example, why do you see most people when, like, life falls apart, they have a bad health issue, they lose their job, and they, fall, they, they like, freak out? You know why that is? Because they had spent their entire life trying to build that kingdom, and now it was crumbling. You with me? And they start freaking out. But see, when you live in a kingdom that will last, and you, and you understand the kingdom perspective of Revelation 5, 9 is going to happen, when everything falls around you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because his kingdom never falls, even when yours does. That's the difference in the, of a Christian. That's, that's, what, that's the power in us because we know how this thing ends. And so this, if, if you understand that, again, I'm trying to help you with perspective. If you understand that, then you know what the majority of your lost friends are dealing with. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, that's what you're dealing with. You're trying to protect a kingdom. You're trying to build your own kingdom. But if you're a Christian here, you don't, it doesn't matter what circumstances, it doesn't matter what happens to you in life because you're a part of a different kingdom. And so that idea changes your perspective. So what's the remedy for all this? The remedy for all this is that the kingdom of darkness... Satan, the great deceiver, Satan, be exposed by the kingdom of light. Right? Colossians 1, 13, uh, 1, 13 to 14 says, For he, speaking of God, rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. Right? So the kingdom of God, this is key, the kingdom of God is not our future hope. It's not a one-day thing for a Christian. The kingdom of God is a present reality that you get to experience today. And it changes your daily life. So I've got literally seven minutes to give you three ways in which it changes your life. So hang with me. Here we go. We Americans, we just can't sit still long, right? So number one, here it is. The kingdom of God changes how you relate. Write that down. I don't see somebody right. You got to write it down. The kingdom of God changes how you relate. What I mean by that? Here's how it changes how you relate. Again, if you understand Revelation 5, 9 is going to happen, and you understand the deceiver, what he's trying to do is try to make you, he wants you to build your own kingdom, Right? If you understand that, 
and you're living under the, the rule and reign of Christ, this is how the rule and reign of Christ changes your life. Number one, it changes how you relate. What do I mean by that? It changes how you relate to God, and it changes how you relate to people. All right? Change to God and people. Well, let's talk about God. How does it change how you relate to God? Here's how it changes how you relate to God. It helps you to understand that knowing that God's number one goal is to expand his kingdom, his rule and reign, then it gives you purpose in life. Everything you have centers on that purpose, right? It also gives you, and how you relate to God, it gives you comfort because you know that Revelation 5, 9, you're standing there already. <laughs> it gives you victory, right? I should have got an amen there too, but I didn't get that. That's cool. You with me? You with me? Like it gives you hope. When everything's falling around you, as a, as a person under the king, in the kingdom of God, under the rule and reign of Christ, you will stand one day in his presence. And you, listen, we already win. Like as a Christian, we don't have to fight for victory for our kingdoms. We fight from victory in his kingdom. We've already got victory. So whatever happens, Paul said, hey, if I die, I die. To be absent here is to be present with him. I get to experience Revelation 5, 9. It's going to be amazing. Because it's victory. It changes how I relate to God. It also changes how I relate to others. The Apostle Paul said it like this. The Apostle Paul said in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 17, he said, He died for everyone, so those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So, so Paul says, because we are, live under the rule and reign of Christ, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. Oh, how I know him differently. He says, this means that anyone who belongs, believe, belongs to Christ has become a new person, and the old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Paul says, because I understand Revelation 5 9 is going to happen, and because I live under the security of the King, King Jesus, he says, I started viewing people differently because I realized, he says, I'm burdened because they're living, building their own kingdoms, and they're going to destruct. Like it moves you to think about that your friends and your neighbors and your family members are building these kingdoms up, and they're going to destruct. And they're not just going to destruct in this world. They're headed fast for a place called hell, and yes, it's real. And so you start, you, start, you start getting impatient with people around you who don't act like you and think like you. What happens is, 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 is you start to be burdened by the loss because they're literally building things that will never last. And they're in this like cycle. They're just in this cycle of worry and anxiety and depression because life is so hard. And their kingdom is crumbling and they have no hope. Oh, they think they do and that's the saddest part. Changes how you relate to others. Number two, it changes how the kingdom of God changes how you live. If there's a kingdom, there's a king. And what he says was what matters. I already said this, but again, this is hard for us to understand because we're a republic. But if there's a king, then that means the people of the kingdom do what the king say. It's just when, listen, it's when I'm the king of my life, it's when I start trying to build my own kingdom that God reminds me that my kingdom will just fail. And you're like, well, I'm a Christian. I don't, maybe I don't build my own kingdom. No, as Christians, because we have one foot in this world and one foot in his kingdom still because of our sin, I constantly find myself on some days focusing too much on building my kingdom. You with me? And I have to, so the way I tell our church is this, is God saved me, and I'm going to be in Revelation 5, 9, but God is saving me every day as well <laughs> because I go back to building my own kingdom. And I have to get this kingdom perspective every day. It changes how I live. Number three, it only changes how I live. It doesn't only change how I relate to God, relate to others. But it also changes what I value. You see, the Bible calls the church, you know what the Bible calls, the, the word for church in the, in the New Testament is the word ecclesia. We have translated kirke. Um, the ecclesia was a, you've know, you got to understand the term. The ecclesia was a, a warlike term. In a very in a kingdom culture, a monarch kingdom culture. So what the ecclesia was was the ecclesia was people, common day people, who the king would then choose to put around his table as counsel to expand his kingdom. So when the New Testament calls us the church, the ecclesia again, it's not a not a kirke, it's not a place to go. It's a people that we belong to, and what this term is, it's a warlike term. 
It's like it's an action term. It's not a come and sit term. It's, it's I'm a king and I have an ecclesia of counsel, and I want to take that kingdom over there, so let's get my leader, my ecclesia together, and let's go take that kingdom. I would have somebody on my ecclesia that, over, that oversaw the troops. You with me? I would have somebody in my ecclesia understand the treasury. I would have somebody in my ecclesia. And so, so when this is written in the New Testament about this being the ecclesia, it's in a kingdom framework. And it's literally this, that you are, as a church are Jesus' ecclesia. And we're at war against the kingdom of darkness that is trying to deceive people to live their own lives, to build their own kingdoms. And we're at war to manifest what it looks like to have the rule and reign of Christ in our life so that we can take back darkness and take over the kingdom. Does that make sense? That's what the, the, the church was a war term. It wasn't a sit and be comfort term. So when you understand the church like that, it changes that you, it, you, you value the church. You value one another. You value that we were meant to do this together on war together to take back the kingdom. And the only way that's going to happen is if the church themselves, the ecclesia, live under the rule and reign of Christ. You know, it's like um, when I'm living under the rule and reign of Christ, when I'm living and saying, God, where do you want my family to live? God, where do you want, what, what, is this the job you want me in? God, is, 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 how do you want me to raise my kids? God, what education do you, God, how do you want me to use my retirement? I live in an area, we have a lot of retirees in our area, and I just get sickened by people that they, they think that like, as a Christian, it was like work all your life so that you can just like play golf all day. We have a 96-year-old man in our church that comes every week, sets, sets up chairs, takes down chairs, doing whatever he can just to see the kingdom expand and reach people. 96 years old. Bedridden wife, amazing man, giving his final days, like going hard, hard to reach more people so they can be released from Satan's power of trying to build their own kingdom to give their life to him, the King Jesus, and find freedom. Giving his life, because his life was not for him, his life was for the kingdom, for King Jesus. Do you, also, do you see what I'm saying? Do you, do you see how it changes your perspective? You start valuing being part of a church that's actually going to be on mission, that's actually going to reach people. You start to live differently every day. You start to see people differently and you broken for people because they're building their own kingdoms that are going to fail. And you start to relate to God with joy even when your circumstances fall because you know that Revelation 5-9 is going to happen one day and you're going to be standing right there. It changes everything. You know what it really does? It makes just going to church and sitting in a pew boring. It's what will make your kids, you parents, look at their mom and dad and say, I never wanted my kids just to say, Dad... I'm glad we're going to church. I wanted my kids to say, Dad, it's amazing being the church. I, wanted my, I want my kids to say, Dad and Mom, like, giving everything their last breath so that somebody can be released from the kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of God and experience the joy that we have in living under the rule and reign of Christ. I wanted that. And for me, that looked like going to Portland. For some of you, that looks like, what does it look like in, in, in Little Rock, Arkansas? To live that way, that your kids would say, man, I love being a part of this, this missional ecclesia, <laughs> living under the rule and reign of Christ. If you'll bow your head with me, I'm going to trust that the Word of God never comes back void, and I'm going to trust that God's been speaking to you this morning. And I'm going to trust that somebody hears the Lord's been working on you for a while about Something that looks absolutely crazy. It looks daunting. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'm going to trust that the Lord is saying, Hey, are you going to let me be the king or are you going to be your own king? And so if that's you this morning, I'm going to, I'm going to trust that we're going to pray. There's going to be some pastors down here down front. They're going to be worshiping, but you can just kind of come down. They're going to see you. You can slip kind of down here and just kneel at the altar and just say, Lord King Jesus. And I think you can do that in your chair, but I think there's something powerful about stepping out and taking a step publicly and saying, get on your knees down here and say, King Jesus, King Jesus, I want to live under your rule and reign. You tell me where to go. You tell me what to give. You tell me what to be. I'll do it all. I'm going to give my life to that. For some of you, it's maybe coming down, you're saying, you know what? I'm building my own kingdom and I don't have... I don't really live under the rule and reign of Christ. I don't really under, I don't really know Jesus. 
as my personal Lord and Savior. Maybe that's you this morning. You're saying, I want to know the freedom, what it's like. I want to know the freedom, what it's like to have the assurance of Revelation 5, 9 and know that I'm going to stand there one day with, with Jesus. I'm tired of living my life. I'm tired of trying to build my own kingdom. It just keeps falling. Like, how long are you going to keep doing that? I'm just going to put my hope and my trust in Jesus. You're going to come down this morning and you're like, well, what do I tell a pastor? Just say Jesus. They'll know. I just want Jesus. They'll know what to do. And so I, I know it's easy to sit there in the seat, but Satan loves that because he can kind of keep you hidden. I, I'm, I'm getting to the place, I call our people like, you need to move. Like, let's move. That's the conference, right, Ben? Let's move. Like, let's take steps to say, King Jesus, I'm yours. No matter if it costs me what people think of me, I'm yours.